Welcome to All Nations Community Church of Homewood. We appreciate your devotion and participation as we continue to pave our way through the Word of God. In order to stay connected with us, we encourage you to connect with us on our website or through social media. If this is your first time with us, we truly want to welcome and thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. We hope you enjoy your time with us. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, we thank and praise God for another day. And I'm just going to pause for just that moment. <laughs> Let us just thank God for another day. Amen. Uh, God is good. And he has sustained us uh, through uh, so many different experiences. And so what I want us to do is uh, kind of take a moment and just kind of wash off the week. I know it's... I know it's um, tempting to hold on and continue to bathe ourselves in all that we experienced on last week, whether good or bad. But one of the things that we, we have to do as we engage God is to lay aside anything that will cause us to miss God. Uh, that, that's a challenge uh, because we you know, hold on to things so tightly and Jesus challenges us to, to lay aside and let go of everything to follow him. And I, I don't know about you, but I, I desire the presence of the Lord. God's presence is my refuge. It's a place where I find rest and restoration at the same time. But, but it means Steve has to, has to wash himself from all that he had experienced this week and settle in and thinking on things that are, that are above and not, not below. So, so what, whatever you need to do to kind of wash yourself of, of this past week, I want, I want to challenge you to do that this morning. Just take a moment, decompress, exhale, say, whew, whew. thank you, Father, for being Jehovah Jireh, for being my provider. Exhale. Begin to inhale all the goodness that we find in the Lord. I'm reminded of the words of David. He says, surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. So, so here's what I want you to do. Just pause and, and rest in that goodness and mercy. Would you do that for me? Just, just rest in that and just think on that. God, thank you that I experience goodness. Thank you that I experience mercy. So let's just begin to engage God this morning, thanking him for his goodness and his mercy. Father, how we thank you and we praise you for this past week. God, we thank you that we experience things, whether good, bad, or indifferent. God, thank you that you have provided for us an opportunity to experience this life. But more importantly, God, we get to experience life with you. That there is a, there's never a moment, God, that we live and exist and have our being apart from you. Father, we bear your fingerprints. God, there is evidence of you creating each of us, God, every single day. And every single day, God, you give us an opportunity, God, to give you glory and honor and worship you for who you are, God. And God, as we pray this morning, God, we're, we're not just simply asking for more stuff. God, we can always get more stuff. God, you've given us the ability to acquire various things. God, thank you for that. But one thing we need more and more each and every day is that we need your, your presence to overwhelm us, to overtake us. So, Father, that we might find our refuge in you, God. Father, I pray that as we look back over this past week and 
and begin to realize, God, that we, we hadn't run to you as frequently as we needed to. God, this morning we run to you. God, we, we enter your presence, God, with thanksgiving. We enter into your courts with praise, Father, because, God, we are here today because of your, your goodness and your mercy, God. Father, thank you for that. God, we thank you, not, God, for not just blessing me and mine, but God, I'm grateful to how you have blessed the body of Christ, God. God, you have blessed us, God, more than we rightfully deserve. Considering how far you have brought us, God, we owed a, a great debt to you, but because of Jesus Christ, he paid it all, and therefore we benefit from being able to enter into your presence and give you praise and honor, God. So, Father, I pray for my friend, my neighbor, my loved one. I pray for the person I'm on Zoom with right now, God, that, that they might experience you today as we commit to run to your presence. God, today, may we be guilty of being God chasers. God, I pray that you will place within us, God, such an insatiable appetite a hungry and a thirst for you, God, that will be unquenchable. God, that we will be relentless in our, in our pursuit of you, God. So that, God, we...
AMCC, we thank you guys. Uh, Zoom, Facebook Live, uh, we tell God thank you, even in, in the midst of everything that we have going on. Uh, we just thank God just for Holy Spirit to be able to come and not only strengthen us and give us power, but give us uh, peace and comfort. And so as this morning we get ready to worship God, let us lay aside, the Bible tells us to lay aside every, everything that so easily uh, entangles us. Um, and so let us focus and concentrate our minds this morning uh, on who he is. Thank God. I'm so glad that we have a good shepherd who was willing to leave the 99 to come after just the one, to come after me. Coming after me There's no 
we have a father who is willing to go the distance we know that we have a good good father Deeper still as you call me, 
deeper still into love 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 you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and i'm loved by you it's who i am it's who i am it's who i am you're a good good father it's who you are god it's who you are it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, yes. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways, God. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect, God, in all your ways. To us, amen. Amen. Just give God a clap, a hand of a praise right where you are. If you know that he is perfect in all of his ways, his thoughts and his plans for you. Amen. heard we have heard that we have a good good father are you glad that we have a good good father who loves you immensely cares for you deeply and provides for you in ways that we can't even imagine and so if you believe uh, that you have a good, good father on your side. Why don't we just go ahead and just give God a hand clap of praise real quick and just say, God, thank you for being a good, good father in spite of me, in spite of my shortcomings, in spite of my failures, in spite of my missteps. God, you are a good, good father. And I'm grateful, watch this, that his goodness is not contingent upon how Steve behaves from day to day. God's goodness is consistent. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God will always be good to each and every one of you because he is a good, good father. Amen. And I just thank God again uh, for just that reminder that he's not just a good father. He's a good, good father. And as you've heard me say before, that when we talk about Hebrew, intensity is expressed in repetition. So to say God is good, that's one thing. But to say he's a good, good father takes him to a whole nother level. My kids may say, Daddy, you are good, Daddy. But they can never say you're a good, good daddy because I am unlike God. So when we talk about a good, good father, that only is reserved for our heavenly father. And I just, again, thank God for being reminded of that truth periodically. Because when we are surrounded by so many different things, especially negative experiences, it's amazing uh, how we forget quickly that we have a good, good father. And because we have a good, good father, uh, Deacon Alvin, uh, the great thing about it is he has a good, good purpose for each and every one of us. So that, that's, that's great news uh, for you and I, that we have a good, good father who has a good, good plan and purpose for you and I. And if you're just joining us, uh, welcome uh, all those who are with us by way of Facebook and uh, by way of Zoom. God bless you. I see you, Brother Ed and Sister Hattie. God bless you this morning. Let me just give you all a wave offering. Hallelujah. <laughs> all right. See uh, Brother Oliver and uh, Sister Maria. God bless you this morning. Hey, hallelujah. 
Y'all looking all blessed. Look at Deacon C, uh, Pastor C on the on the line. All right. Sister Regina, y'all look like y'all ready to bless the Lord. I see some hand claps already. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So if you're just joining us uh, over the past few weeks, uh, we've been studying through uh, the book, The Purpose Driven Life. And, and with that, uh, we've also uh, been doing a sermon series entitled such. We, we want to discover uh, the purpose that God has us here. We want to answer the question as best we can. What on earth am I here for? And if you're wondering that, um, the first week we, we kind of dived into this, we, we said that first and foremost, we don't want to waste our life, that God has created us. He's put breath in our lungs, uh, and we, we should not wet, waste any moment that God has given to us. So if, if you're awake this morning and you have breath in your lungs, you have an opportunity to not waste any more moments that God has given to you. So week one, don't waste your life. Week two, we, we kind of push it a little further. We ask the question, what on earth am I here for? And if you remember, we said that God created all things, all right? And through all things, watch this, he has a purpose for all things. So God created all things for himself, all right? So, so, so when we think about God's uh, purposes, God, first of all, created each of us. So, so it's easy to get lost in this whole notion that God created all things. But when we think more specifically, God has created you. Now, I know you're looking at yourself when you're considering yourself like, wait a minute. Does the Lord know how I am? Yes, God made you <laughs> just as wonderful as you are according to his purposes and according to his plans. And then we got into the very first purpose uh, that, that Rick Warren points out in his book. And he says the very first uh, purpose that we were created, it, we were created for God's pleasure. We, we were created to be worshipers. Uh, we were created to recognize the holiness of who God is, the inadequacies that, that rest within us and begin to ascribe worship unto God. That because of his mercies, uh, we're not consumed. And because of who God is, and what he has done for us, we began to give God worship. And if you remember last week, uh, we said for each of us, uh, we're called to be worshipers because the Lord is seeking such to worship him. So, so as we have been uh, enlightened to the truth of who Jesus is, and we have been filled with his spirit, then the response to that is to give God worship. So, so he says the very first purpose for every created thing is to give God worship. So, so let's pause here for just a moment. If you have not engaged God in worship, uh, this is your opportunity to just begin to give God worship because that's why God created you, is to give him worship. He didn't create you to attend worship. He didn't create you so that you can go to worship. He created you and I so that we might worship him in spirit and truth. Now, let's be very clear. You know, your worship may not look like my worship. And that's okay. But as long as we recognize who God is and begin to esteem him to his proper place in our hearts, in our lives, and among the saints, then he is worshiped. Amen. So, so he does not give us a prescription on how to worship. He just has an expectation for you and I to worship. And so today we get into purpose number two. Uh, for those who are taking notes, that purpose number two is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it is the purpose that we were created, and that is to fellowship. I wish I had some help right there. We were created for fellowship. We were created for community. We were created, watch this, not for our selfish selves, but we were created for the benefit of other people. So, so we bring all of that to the table in fellowship. God doesn't call us to homogeny. He doesn't call us to sameness. God calls us. To fellowship, And that means that there's a diverse group of people that can come together because of Jesus Christ and begin to fellowship with one another. And let me be very clear uh, that when we say fellowship, we're not talking about after church having cookies and juice. All right. No, 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 no. We're, we're talking about authentic, meaningful relationships that transcends differences. So, so we understand that God has created us unique. We talked about that last week, that we were created unique. We were created special. And because of that, it makes it incredibly difficult, <laughs> apart from Jesus, 
for us to dwell in unity. I wish I had some help. I'm, I'm going to try that one more time. Because of our uniqueness and our differences, it makes it incredibly difficult uh, for us to dwell in unity. Okay, I thought I was going to have some help on that. I'm going to try it one more time for the Holy Ghost. Because of our uniqueness and our differences, it makes it incredibly difficult to always get along with everybody at the same time. Uh, okay, I got two more amens. Um, and so the Bible tells us that we must pursue unity with all people, not the ones that, that are in our, our favorite five. You know, it's, it's easy to, to kind of stay within that, those, those, those spaces where people accommodate us, think like us, act like us. It's, it's easy to love them. But if you were watching uh, Daddy Darn discussions on last week, Jesus says, I, I want you to expand your capacity to love. I want you to love not just your neighbors, but love your enemies, too. Uh, yes, Jesus said that in your Bible, if you hadn't torn that out. So, so, so he, he challenges us to, to become uncomfortable. Oh, gosh. Jesus challenges us to be uncomfortable in community. And that's where the principle love comes to comes to mind, that the reason why we're able to love in, or be in community or be in fellowship with one another is not just because we just know how to get along. It's because we understand the principle of love. And, and if we understand that God is love, God gives us unconditional love, then it's our responsibility to love one another. So with that in mind, I want us to turn to 1 John chapter 4. Uh, we're going to dive into this in just a few moments, but I, I want us to begin to pray for uh, the preservation of unity in the body of Christ. Now, I, I, I'm fully aware of this. Um, that the pandemic has, has caused us to be you know, kind of far away from each other. So it's been hard for us to have um, meaningful fellowship with one another. We, we, you know, certainly we have virtual communities and uh, we're doing these kinds of things to try to maintain fellowship. Um, but as we set a precedence for us, as we regather and we come back together in person, you know, we want to highlight fellowship as an essential, critical aspect to who we are as a church. So before I pray it, let me share something very personal. Uh, can, can I be human for a moment? Let me let me watch my people. All right, Juan says I can be human. All right, Brother Ed. All right, the ones like, okay, Hattie said it's okay. All right, let me make sure. All right, Regina said, okay, all right, I think I got enough amens on that. Okay, so, so as I think about uh, my spiritual journey, church has been kind of a love-hate relationship. Thank you, Sister Shelley. Um, there, there have been times I experienced great joy in the body of Christ. I, I experienced restoration, healing in the body of Christ. But then the opposite is also true that I also experienced great pain uh, within the body of Christ. Um, but, but even in those moments of pain, God showed me the, what was so essential and what makes the church so unique is the ability to heal. In, in, in this world, there, it is difficult to just heal on your own. You have to sometimes go to the doctor and, uh, and get something to be prescribed to help you heal. Um, in the body of Christ, Jesus is that balm, that healing factor within his church to, to heal the wounds of past relationships. So when I experienced pain in, a, in, in, one, in the church I was a part of, and, and, I, and at one point, and I'm just going to be very human for a moment, I, I, I made up my mind, I'm done with church. Yeah, I just said that live. I, I said to the Lord, I'm done with church because of the pain. I said, I, I, I don't have to deal with this because there was an expectation that in the body of Christ that, that, that we were going to be able to get along, that we we're going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. But unfortunately, people can be people. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as much as we want to ignore that reality, that is a very real experience in the, in the, in the body of Christ, that humans will be humans, people will be people, and sometimes unintentionally may say something or do something, or intentionally. But God, in his wisdom, allowed me to experience such pain, but then also experience such healing in his church. My challenge for, for all nations is for us to always pursue to be a place of healing 
with people who have been harmed and hurt by life's experience, that they can come in to this fellowship and be, begin to experience the healing balm from Christ through his church, that we become the expression of that balm in, in, in the flesh. That although we understand in the spirit, the, the Lord is that bomb that heals, but, but we become the practical application of that reality. So we, because we know that Jesus heals, he uses our hands and feet to be that application of that healing. So as we pray, let, let us pray for that reality for our church, that we will be a place of healing through our unity that we will lay aside preferences and, our, and what we tend to ascribe to, that we'll lay down our agendas so that we can experience healing in the body of Christ. Now, now I know what you're saying, Pastor, aren't we that place already? No, yes, we, we are that place. I totally get that. But there's always room for improvement. I, you know, we want to continue to strive to be that place where all people, regardless of where they're from, the color of their skin, their economic status, the gender, it doesn't matter that this becomes a place where all feel welcomed, loved, and healed. So let's pray that principle to become a reality. Can we do that this morning? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the grace that you give to us, the mercy that you extend to us. God, thank you that in you we have an opportunity to get some things right, to become a better place of healing. God, thank you that in so many ways, God, you've been so gracious to us that you've allowed us to overcome any differences, to be a place of refuge for so many. May we continue to be that place of refuge for any and all persons. God, thank you. Thank you, God, for giving us the church where it becomes a place, not just a place, but it's a people united under one cause, and that is the risen Savior. And because of that reality, God, we become a place, we become a people where healing exists. God, thank you for giving us the ability to see past people's faults and begin to give to them based upon their needs. God, thank you for that. Because God, you look past all of our faults and met all of our needs. And Father, thank you for doing just that. So God, I pray that you put within us this desire to not just pursue you, but then also pursue people. Because, God, as we pursue your presence, God, we begin to understand more about the mind of God and how you love us unconditionally. And then when we pursue people, God, that becomes a reality. Thank you, Father, for being the example of love.
Amen. So as apparently the enemy is busy and wants to thwart this word from going forth on today. So we're we going to press on in anyway. Amen. Uh, because anytime we start talking about unity, um, it's amazing how all of a sudden <laughs> all these disruptions start happening. We talk about pursuing God's presence. We start saying say pursuing people, then it cuts out <laughs> I mean, because there, there's a there's a power. That, that comes when we are united under one cause, that there's a power associated when we pursue God's presence and we pursue people, then God does some amazing things uh, be in his in, in and through his church. And, 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 and that's exactly where I was really I was getting ready to go. I was getting ready to quote uh, a, a guy by the name of Andrew Murray, uh, who was a principal figure in the South African revival of 1860. And this is what he says. And I love this. One of the great causes of why God cannot bless his church is a want of love. I'm going to say that one more time. One of the great causes of why God cannot bless his church is a want of love. And for, for, for Andrew, because of the lack of love in those days, he believed that God could not bless his church mightily because of the absence of love in the church then. Don't miss what I'm saying. Because of the lack of love in the church then, he says God is not going to move mightily. And I love how he says that it's not that he doesn't say that we need more of God's power. Because that's evident. God is omnipotent. God can do all things. But he says one of the things that prohibits that power from moving, he does not mention prayer. Because that should be already established in the body of Christ. Because he says, my house should be a house of prayer. But he says, and he says one of the reasons that, that the church is not as effective as it should be because love is lacking in the body of Christ. He said that back in 1860, we are now in 2021. And some would argue that that's still a very true statement in today's church, which would be a very dangerous assertion because we're saying we want to see a move of God. We want to see God do some amazing things. And God, we want to hear you. We want to, want to see you. But then God is saying is, how's the love quality? in the church, in my church. And he says, and, and if we have divisions and, and factions and, and cliques within the body of Christ, he says, that will prohibit uh, a move of God because a lack of love is a sign of disunity. Oh my gosh. So, so, so if Jesus prays, he says, all right, and you've heard me quote this many times over in John chapter 17, he says, if, if my disciples are one as the Father and I are one, he says, the world, watch this, would know that I sent my son. So, so when we are on one accord, when we're walking in unity and pursuing peace with all men, the Bible says we give evidence to the reality of Jesus coming. That, so that means that across uh, racial lines, across, across socioeconomics, across uh, gender differences, God says, I'm able to bring all people together. Why? Because I am God. And he says, and when we dwell in, in, in true unity, where love is evident, where love is evident, then the power of God will move through his church. So, so for Andrew, he was concerned that, that people may have been pursuing power and pursuing God's spirit and pursuing all these different things for the manifestation of God's power. And he says, no, here's what I need you to do. Start loving each other. <laughs> he says, when you begin to do that, then that enhances unity. And when unity is enhanced, oh gosh, thank you. He says, then my power moves through unity. So, um, yeah, I remember back in grade school, uh, we had the pleasure of doing um, science projects. And I, I wanted to create this, this circuit uh, where I had this little, uh, little tab, this little metal tab that would connect with this little connector and it would complete this loop and turn a light bulb on. And as long as that connector was not touching the tab, there was no power. Oh gosh. 
But the moment I pressed down on the tab and it connected, the power circulated through the entire circuit and the light bulb came on. So what am I saying? When we begin to connect with each other, then the power of God can begin to circulate more freely without interruptions so that the light, who is Jesus Christ, may be evident among the church, but then also within the community. So, so when we connect, oh, yes, when we connect to one another and watch this and stay connected, because notice what I said, as long as I applied the pressure to the connector, then the circle was, it wasn't just I touched it one time and that was it. No, you had to remain connected so that the circuit and the power may flow freely. And, and, and if you're one of those introverts, and, I, and, I, and I'm a closet introvert, believe it or not, uh, uh, once, once uh, you, w w you know, I'm, I'm away from people, I, I try to hide as much as possible. Um, and some of y'all saying, amen, pastor, a amen. <laughs> but, but even the introvert, we're called to connect to people, period, because that's what maintains the circuit of power to flow through his church so that we can highlight Jesus Christ. So, so when we talk about fellowship, fellowship is living in God's family. All right, I'm going to say that one more time. If you take your notes, when we talk about fellowship, it is simply this. It is living in God's family. So God created you and I for his pleasure, number one. Number two, for his people. <laughs> yes. So that means that you were created for other people. John Orberg says this, um, and, I, and I wish I can recall his book, but he, he, he gave us this notion. He says that God forms us with people, me meaning that he begins to reshape us with people around us. So, so we need fellowship. Uh, as, as the scripture says that iron sharpens iron. We, we're made better, we're improved upon when we have diversity of thought. So when we have the, in the, within the body of Christ, we have instant diversity because he says, I want you to make disciples of all nations. Immediately, we're talking about multi-ethnic and multi-generational, immediately. So, so he's not saying, I want you to be homogenous. I want you to be willing to, to experience and be around people who don't share your cultural values. Oh, my. So, so, so Brother Juan, here, here's what the Lord is saying. He says, I want you to be uncomfortable being around other people. Yes. Yes. He says, I, I want you to be okay with sitting down with someone who doesn't live like you. So fellowship is living within God's family, not just associating. Be oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Be because that, that's how many of us treat church. It's like a social club. It's, it's just a gathering place. Uh, th there's not meant to be meaningful relationships. And, and so what, what, what fellowship tells us is that it's not about just association. It is about living with. So it embodies uh, the words of Jesus where he says that I've come, watch this, and I dwelt among them, or I moved in your neighborhood. So, so Jesus is not just trying to be, be an associate of ours. He wants to be our family. Okay, so all right, some of y'all not picking. All right, let's think about it like this. Uh, anybody ever seen the movie, uh, Look Who's Coming to Dinner, or, or it's, it's something of that nature? Guess who's coming to dinner? Anybody ever seen that? All right, some of y'all, okay, praise the Lord. They, they made a newer version with Bernie Mac and uh, Ashton Kutcher. Uh, the whole idea is that uh, someone who is uh, part of a family brings in someone who is drastically different. Uh, so in the original version, uh, Sidney Poitier shows up on the scene. They're like, wait a minute. And, and if you remember, <laughs> you remember the look of the mom? <laughs> some of y'all remember? <laughs> They're like, she was like, she, she had no words. And, and for many of us in the body of Christ, we, when we see someone who looks different and lives different than us, then we have that same look like. And, and if we're not careful, that will cause people to distance themselves. And so within the family, that means, oh gosh, thank you. 
in the family, if you remember the story in, in the movie, in both instances, they all sat at the same table to have dinner. Because that's the premise, because family sit together at the dinner table. That's what living in a family is. That's the epitome of family is, is can I sit at your dinner table and have supper with you? I'm sorry, that's a Southern thing. I'm sorry, supper, I'm sorry. Can I have dinner with you? All right, <laughs> so, so can I do that? And if I can't have dinner with you, then that means we're not really family. So when you look, at through, when you look out through the gospels, what do you see Jesus doing? He's having dinner with people. He's having meals with folks. And how dare we then as a body of Christ become so insulated where we don't want somebody to come hang out at our crib and have dinner with us. So, so, so we got to be very careful that we don't begin to live a life that is the, the antithesis of Christ. Christ says, I, you know, I want you to be family, not just church members. And so the principle that, that leads us to this notion of, of, of being able to be family is characterized and summed up with one word, love. Say it, say it, say it from down here. Say love. Amen. Why don't you type uh, and send a message to somebody right now uh, that's either on Zoom or on Facebook. Just tell them I love you, man. <laughs> I, I, I love you. I, I care about you. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. I see you. I love you, too. Love is the principle that drives, it's the engine that drives our family. Write down John chapter 13, verse 35. John chapter 13, verse 35, and then we'll get to our passage here in just a moment. He says, and this is Jesus' words, he says, by this all people, oh, I love that. By this all people would know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So when we love one another, we tell the truth about being a disciple. When we choose, watch this, to distance ourselves or become unloving towards someone, then we essentially make Jesus a liar. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say that one more time. When, when, when I choose to be unloving, when I choose to be unkind, when I choose to be uh, lacking compassion, then I'm making Jesus a liar because he says his disciples, Paul's Hit the pause button. So when we say disciple, we, we're talking about someone who is a legitimate follower of Jesus Christ. So Pete Gang, he says, so if you're a legitimate follower of Jesus Christ, then people would know that not because you say I'm a Christian, not because you were a Christian teacher. He says because you love one another. He says that's how people will know your mind. So, so we understand that love must be preeminent in the body of Christ, especially if you remember what Andrew Murray says. So if love is evident, then the power of God moves. And I don't know about you, but I, I want the power of God to move. I, I, I don't know about you. <clears throat> I don't know what you're in need of, but, but I need, uh, especially over these past couple of years, I need the power of God to move in a mighty way. And the only way... All nations, we are going to experience the power of God is that we got to learn to love one another. Now, hear my heart. I am not saying we're not loving. Hear what I'm saying. We want to continue to increase our capacity to love one another so that God's power can be greater among us. Because that may be a loose connection somewhere. <laughs> and, and we need that connection so that his power will be evident. So now let's get, let's get into our passage on today, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, picking up at verse 19, and we'll hit through 21. And he says, we love, oh, I love this, because he first loved us. <clears throat> Excuse me. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, and this is right here in your Bible, he is a liar. He says, if anyone says, I love God and hate my brother, <laughs> he is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Oh, my gosh. And this commandment we have from him, being Jesus, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So let me let me set the context and then I'll be I'll be done. So this is uh, the Apostle John 
writing this letter from Ephesus. Uh, and this is John, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James. He writes, this writes to the church in Asia Minor between AD 80 and AD 95. He writes this to this first century church because they constantly fought confusion, distortions, inaccuracies, and outright denials of Jesus revealed. Okay, so when we say Jesus revealed, uh, we're talking about that he uh, revealed himself through the word and through the witness of people. Uh, so so he, Jesus revealed himself um, in word and through the witness of people. Um, and so what we saw is a lot of things happening in this early church because there was, oh gosh, because of there was an seemingly an absence of the presence of the Lord. Whenever there's an absence of God's presence, we can expect confusion to ensue. We, we can expect distortions to, to take place. And that because, and that's because of his presence not being evident in his body. And so it creates high levels of toxicity in the church. Okay, so, so and I'm using church loosely here because it should not be <laughs> that the church has high levels of toxicity in relationships in the body of Christ if we love one another. And in that first century church back then, that's what they were battling. <laughs> back then, they were battling confusion, distortion, inaccuracies, and the denial of Jesus Christ. And that should not be evidence in the church right now <laughs> because what drives away that kind of foolishness Y'all ready for this? Is love. <laughs> what, what drives away confusion is love. What drives away distortions is love. Let me give you a great example. Uh, oh, gosh. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Sometimes people have a hard time believing the best about folk. So I'll give you an example. Somebody may say to me, Pastor, um, you look good today, but I don't like that sweater that you're having. It is not flattering. Now, I can take offense to that and pop off. <laughs> I can say, Ed, how dare you say to me that, you, that this sweater is not flattering? You don't know. <laughs> I, I, can, I can pop off. But if I believe the best about Ed, I know he's coming from a place of love, not from a place of hatred. So although it may hurt to hear that, I accept it because of who I know Ed to be. I know he loves me and vice versa. So, so when we believe the best about people, it does not distort the message that we hear from people. And oftentimes the source of conflict in the body of Christ is because there's the, a distortion in what we're hearing because we don't believe the best about one another. I wish I had some help in here. So, so when I understand that I believe the best about you and you believe the best about me, then I can speak truth to you out of love, not out of condemnation. <laughs> so, 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 in the body of Christ, the way we minimize distortion and inaccuracies and confusion is that we have to enhance our capacity to love. Now, now remember, John, First John tells us earlier in this chapter that God is love. So he is the full personification of love. He is perfected love. We are not. <laughs> right. Don't miss that. So, so as I'm saying that we need to learn to love, that means that we are imperfect in our ability to love one another. God is perfect in love. We're trying to get there. We're trying to, we're trying to imitate the love of God to the best of our ability. So that means that we have to continue to exercise our love muscles. Oh, my gosh. So, so, so without exercising our love muscles, then we don't increase our capacity and our ability to love. Oh, gosh. So as John writes this, he understands that this local community is dealing with uh, all kinds of toxic issues. Um, and he identifies uh, really throughout the first, uh, first book of John, three major movements. I just want you to write these down. He identifies three major things um, in first John. First and foremost, he says that we must have, watch this, right belief in Jesus. 
So before we even get into love, <laughs> he starts off the letter by saying, you need to have a right belief in Jesus because he understands that this church did, had a distorted belief about Jesus. Because in this first century church, they had uh, an issue with Gnosticism, which diminishes the person of Christ because they denied the resurrection. And so because they denied the resurrection, oh my gosh, it distorted their ability to love. Why? Because they had a less than view of Jesus Christ. If Jesus in your theology is not lifted, that he had died and, and rose again, if he is not part, is that, if that's not part of your theology, then you're not serving the right Jesus. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so we must believe wholeheartedly that Jesus died and rose again so that we can have a proper view of Jesus. Therefore, we can love more sufficiently. So he addresses right belief in Jesus. Secondly, he addresses having right obedience to God's commands. I love it. He says, you need to have, I'm going to say it one more time, right obedience to God's commands. That means you must obey right. <laughs> so, so I have heard God's commands and I executed based on what I heard, not my, <laughs> a distorted interpretation. All right. So I'm sorry. I just had a moment uh, because oftentimes I think about when, when you're communicating with children, you have to be explicit. You have to be clear because there, there's a temptation for children to reinterpret what you say it. <laughs> I wish I had some help right there uh, because you may say clean your room, but they may reinterpret that by saying, I'm going to push everything under my bed or push it into my closet. <laughs> and, and, and all that you see is clean, daddy. But the reality is I just pushed it somewhere else. <laughs> so I say, no, not just clean your room. I t take all them clothes off the floor, put it in a hamper. Take the hamper downstairs, put the clean clothes in your car. I mean, you had to be very specific. So, so what John is saying that you have to know God's word and you have to understand how to execute what he's told you to do. And especially for those who are in the military, you understand completely about obeying instructions because that can literally mean life and death if you're in the battle, right? So, so we're, because we're in a spiritual battle, we cannot afford to misinterpret what God has said. So if he says, love your neighbor or love your enemies, it means life or death for the, for the body of Christ because we need love. But then thirdly, uh, right love for one another. He addresses having right love for one another. This, this letter, although it's coming from the Apostle John, is a very pastoral letter to deal with the conflict that was happening in the body of Christ. And the source of this conflict were people who had dissenting views about Jesus. <clears throat> okay. Not only is conflict because of you know, our distortions, but when people have a dissenting view of Jesus, it's going to raise the level of co confusion and conflict in the body of Christ. So as I stated about the Gnostics that moved in, they began to, to teach false doctrine to the people who, and it caused them to lower who Jesus is. And because this lowered view of Jesus, then chaos ensued. So that means we have to be very careful about the kinds of teaching that goes on in the body of Christ. So that means you and I must be learned it, people. That means we got to know God's word for ourselves so that if we hear something that seems to be contradictory to God's word, we need to rebuke that. Why do we do that? Because if we don't rebuke that and refute that false teaching, then it's going to allow confusion and chaos to happen in the body of Christ. So let's make sure we know God's word. All right. So as we and, I, and I'm going to move on. Because, man, it's, it's so much. Oh, my gosh, it's so much in this, these few verses. But, but what John lays out for us is very clear that, that the only way we're to love or able to love is because God loved us. And so there's a couple of things that I want to make note of, and then we'll raise up on out of here. So what John begins to explain is how do we preserve fellowship uh, in the body of Christ? A couple quick things. The way you preserve uh, fellowship in the body of Christ, point number one is very clear. No fake love. <laughs> he says, if, if you're going to preserve fellowship uh, in the body of Christ, then there must not be any 
fake love. So when you look at verse 19, and I love this, uh, verse 19 is very straightforward because he starts off by saying, he says, we love why, and he tells us why. He says the reason why we love is because God first loved us. Let that sink in. John is saying that the reason we're able to love to begin with is because God loved us first. Now, I, I know it's tempting to think that, that we've always been this saved, sanctified, wonderful self. I, I know we would love to believe that we've always been this person, but, but the idea of Christ, God loving us first existed before we gave our life to Jesus. So that means, hang on in there, that means that Jesus loved our pre-Christ self. <laughs> okay, y'all didn't catch that. Okay, let me, let me try that one more time. Jesus' love didn't just start <laughs> when we said yes to him. While we're yet sinners, <laughs> Christ died for us. Mm -hmm. And watch this. And because of that truth, that meant his love preexisted our yes and amen. <laughs> okay. If, if we're not careful, we can so divorce ourselves for who we, who we used to be <laughs> and forget that we were something else. I'm, no, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> the reality is that, that we have been and we were <laughs> something else. <laughs> and, but for God's grace, we are who we are today. And, and so if I forget how he loved me in my pre-Christ self, then I forget that that becomes the example that I now need to extend to somebody else. Oh my gosh. So if then he loved me in my messy toe up from the flow up self, then I can love somebody else in the same way. I wish I had an amen on that. Uh, he says, Jesus loved you first. <laughs> And now you have the ability to love. So in other words, God took the initiative to love you. <laughs> yes, he did. So, so I think back to uh, going, back, um, going back a little bit, 20, 23 years almost, <clears throat> when I started dating Jorson. And I remember, I remember saying, I love you before she said it. I took the initiative. And it's, it's that same kind of principle that, that especially in the Greek, this, this word first literally means first in time. So because God exists outside of time, watch this, God takes the initiative to love us. And, and, and then therefore, oh gosh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Therefore, we must take the initiative to love somebody. Oh, God. It, it doesn't mean we have to wait till they get it right, do it perfectly, do it the way I said it. It is to love them first before they are, they're lovable. It, it's easy to love somebody when they're lovable, but when they're unlovable, it is incredibly difficult to say, whoo, I sure love that person who just, who, just, who just knocked my car off the road. I, whoo, I love them. I love this person who just stole $500. Whoo, I love them. No, we're trying to find a way to get back at them. <laughs> You're laughing because you know that's true. So, so we must, hear me good, take the initiative to love people. Okay? We must... And you and go ahead and write that part down. You might want to write that down just in your journal. I must take the, initi the initiative to love somebody. And so then John goes on, and then we begin to encounter what, uh, what is described as if anyone statements. If anyone says, so, so John says this a few times throughout his book. Matter of fact, go ahead and write these passages down. Uh, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, uh, you'll see these this if anyone says statement. Chapter 1, verse 8. Chapter 1, verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 6. 
chapter 2, verse 9. Because as he's building a case, what John seems to be addressing is he's examining someone who has made a, a statement of saying, I love God. He, he's examining a person who says, I love God. I love God. But then he's, he's, he's now juxtaposing that to their actions of their heart and their actions. Because he says, if you say that you love God, but hates his brother, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just quoting the scripture now. I'm just quoting the scripture. John calls them a liar. Now, let, let me make sure I, I'm very clear. So, so, you know, just like I said, when, you know, when I'm talking with my children, I want to make sure I give clear instructions. I am no way saying that you now have license to just run up on somebody that, that says that they love God, but you know that they hate somebody in their heart. And you just go to them and just say, hey, you liar, you, 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 you liar, you. <laughs> So don't, 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 don't go out there and say, Pastor said, man, you know, start calling y'all some lies around here. And don't. He says, you may identify them as a liar because what seems to be incongruent is how they're saying they love someone they cannot see, but they cannot practically love somebody whom they can see, touch, and feel. So there's a song uh, by the wonderful poet, uh, Drake. He describes um, this, this kind of a uh, love. He calls it fake love. Let me share some bars or sort some lines from, uh, from Drake's fake love. He says, I got fake people showing fake love to me straight up to my face. Straight up to my face. That's what he says in his lyrics. Then he says, something ain't right when you're talking. Look like you're hiding your problems. Really? You never were solid. In so many words, I love this. Drake was saying, you weren't real to begin with. That, he, said, he said, you never was authentic to begin with, so why am I really surprised? He says, I can tell that your, lake is, your love is fake. I don't trust a word that you say. He is saying that you have fake love and it is evidence because you never were authentic. And I can hear the words that you're saying. So when we talk about gospel community, gospel community is designed that different people can be a part of this body. So, so the, the gospel community must have a different ecosystem than the world. So if Drake is describing fake love in the world, that should not be our theme song in the church. And, and, and uh, you know, some of y'all may know that I watch a little wrestling with my son from time to time. And um, oftentimes, even in boxing, you have these, com these competitors who have this walk-in or, or entrance music that describes their character. So if, if, if our theme song becomes Drake's fake love, then that becomes our theme song to the world that don't know Jesus. And I pray that that is not the case. I pray that when people know, uh, when people are part of this church family, they know that they're going to experience real love. And I almost broke out in the song when I heard when I said real love, but I'm not going to sing it today. But but the, in the body of Christ, they must experience real love. Amen. Let me give you a quote by John Stott, and then I'll give you this last uh, last point. John Stott says this. He says it is obviously easier to love and serve a visible man than an invisible God. And if we fail in easier tasks, it is absurd to claim success in the harder. What John is arguing is that if I <laughs> cannot perform the easier task of loving my neighbor, it's incredibly difficult to prove to someone I can do the harder task of loving God whom I cannot see, touch, or feel. So, so, so let's get to practicing the easier task so that we can tell the world that we really do love God, not with our lips, but with our heart and our actions. Then verse 21, he gets into now real love. I love it. All right. 
he gets into real love, verse, verse 21. I love it. He, he essentially says uh, and lays out this kind of theological strategy to the church. He, and I love this because essentially he's, he's parroting uh, the words of Jesus. Uh, right down Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22. Verses 37 through 39. Matthew 22 verses 37, 39. So this is, this is uh, if you remember the conversation, uh, some of the, uh, the religious leaders came up and rolled up on Jesus and like, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Because they were trying to trap Jesus. That's um, kind of what they did back then. They want to trap Jesus and they want to hear him in, essentially contradict someone, especially Moses. So what Jesus does, because he understood the word, because he was the word, he, he tells them the greatest command, first of all, love God with all your heart, with all your might, with all who you are. In so many words, love God with all of who you are. And then he couples that and he tethers that reality by saying, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. All right. He says, now I want you to love God, with all of who you are, now take that same principle, now love others as you love yourself. And what John now is doing is referencing this command that Jesus gave. This was not a suggestion. This wasn't a recommendation. Uh, this wasn't just a good idea. No, this was a command that was supposed to be executed, that I'm supposed to love all of, all of God, but then also make it a practice to love others. So love or the love of God tethers itself to the reality of loving people. We cannot untether that. We cannot separate and say, I love God with all my heart. But that, that Stephen, woo, I can't stand that dude. <laughs> I, I can't say I love God. And, and I look at Tanya and say, no, I, I, I can't, I can't stand her. I don't, I don't love her. I, give me somebody else to love. No, no. Because I understand that the love of God compels me and commands me to love people, even when it's difficult to love them. I know, I, I know Steve can be something else. <laughs> I know Steve can be hard to love. Uh, however, you got to love me anyway. Ain't nobody saying nothing. Okay, y'all, y'all looking down. Y'all want to look up at me on that one. Okay. All I'm saying is, <laughs> I know I can be something else, but I'm y'all something else. <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> Just like I can be something else. <laughs> I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> I'm getting tickled. So, so we know we can be something else to one another. But that means that we, because we understand the love of God, we have the capacity to love each other. D. Edmund Hybert says this, and I love this quote. He says, since God's love is no longer visible in the incarnate Christ. So let, let me pause here. So when we say incarnate, we're talking about uh, Jesus' earthly ministry when he took on flesh and dwelt among us. So he says, because uh, God's love is no longer visible in the incarnate Christ here on earth, God is manifesting his love as it is now displayed in his people. So God's love is manifested by the love we share with one another. And I'm going to repeat this, and you, I want you to write down, if you didn't write it down before, I'm going to repeat this. Love is the principle by which this family operates. Love is the principle by which this family lives by, which makes fellowship possible. Without love, fellowship is impossible. Let's just be very, very clear. We, we can sit in the same space with somebody, but not be in fellowship. Fellowship, as I stated before, is being able to have dinner together. Or, in other words, have a meal together with someone. Jesus oftentimes, and I love this. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you for that. Jesus oftentimes sat with people that did not reflect who he was. He, he was criticized for sitting at the table with prostitutes and sinners, tax collectors. He, that's, that's how his life was characterized. 
by sitting across the table who, with people that didn't look like him, thought like him, behave like him. That's the template by which we love one another, that we sit across the table with people that don't look like us. All right, a couple things um, I want you to write down. There's four levels of fellowship that I want to make mention of, and then we'll, we'll get on out of here. As a good preacher, that's my third time to close. The first level of fellowship is membership. That means choosing, choosing to belong. Write down Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19. The first level of fellowship is membership, meaning that you're a part of something. You're choosing to be, belong. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 from the Living Bible says this. You are members of God's very own family, and you belong in God's household with every other Christian. Okay? So when I choose to belong, that because God has made a way for me to be a part of his family, okay? Number two, the second level, friendship. Friendship is learning to share. <laughs> Amen, somebody. As a friend, I share what I have with you. Acts chapter two, verse 44. I'm reading this from the Living Bible too. He says, all the believers met together constantly and shared everything with each other. So, so within fellowship is sharing because I've chosen to belong and to be a part of God's family. Level three, partnership. Partnership. This is a big one. Partnership means doing my part. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, somebody. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Oliver. <laughs> that means everyone must do their part. Right now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. And this is from the, I'm sorry. Thank you, Maria. Thank you for that. <laughs> I'm going to edit that part out. I'm going to edit that part. Okay. <laughs> Level three is partnership, doing my part from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. He says, we are partners together, working together for God. So each of us brings our gifts, our talents, our abilities to the church family. I don't withhold. I don't, I don't hold on. I don't hoard all of who I am at the expense of the church. No, I share all of who I am, working and serving alongside my brother's and sisters. Level four, and I love this. Uh, this is kinship. Level four, loving believers like family. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, level four is, is it, you can even say, you can put out beside that family. Write down Acts chapter two, verse 42. Acts chapter two, verse 42. And this is from the contemporary English Bible. He says, they were like, and this is them talking about the gospel community or the early church. They were like family to each other. Isn't that good to hear <laughs> that the church was described as a family? It wasn't described as a building. It wasn't described uh, as people who uh, just believed in Christ. It described a people who identify themselves as a family. That is big time. It's, it's not just, again, the association, but it's about us now looking at each other as not church members, but you my, you my family. <laughs> you my family. And it changes the dynamics. Because when you think about family, family is made up of a lot of different people. You don't get to choose. <laughs> I wish I had some help. You don't get to choose who's in your family. You show up at a, a family reunion like, man, you in my family? <laughs> Some of you want to uh, like almost take, take a, like a blood test, like, oh, let me make sure <laughs> that we in the same family. But you don't get to choose. God just blesses us with the family. Praise the Lord. And, and, and the family of God is the same, that we don't get to choose who's a part of our family. 
Jesus made it possible for any and all people. He says, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. And, and through that, uh, God fashioned and formed a family. B because for God, family is preeminent. Um, relationships are preeminent. How do we know that? Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 2, he says very clearly, he says that it's not good for man to be alone. So, so there's a need for a fellowship. There's a need for a relationship. And we have to be that to one another, to be love towards one another, even when it's inconvenience. And <laughs> even when it's inconvenience in any one of us, we love authentically, passionately, because God so loved us and desires and takes delight in us. So as we go to God in prayer, I want to invite you to just think of our church as family. Begin to orient yourself around that notion that we are family. <laughs> I almost broke out in it. I felt it. It was rising up in me. We are family. <laughs> I got all my... No, let me stop. <laughs> but indeed, we are family. Good, bad, and indifferent. We are family because Jesus made it possible. And because he made it possible, let us be family. So, so I'm going to challenge you to do this. Um, I've been practicing this as best I could. To stop referring to my, my church family as just the church or members. I try to use the language of saying, this is my family whom I love and am loved by. This is my family. We don't just have our names on a roster. No, you are my family. And scripture gives us this notion that friends stick closer than a brother. So, so in, in, in Proverbs, it gives us this notion that although we may have blood kins, the blood of Jesus makes us even closer family than our own relatives. So I'm that crazy cousin. <laughs> I'm, I, I've already called that one. So I, I don't know who you're going to be in the family, but I'm crazy cousin, okay? <laughs> you be who you are. You be sanctified Sally. I, I don't know who you're going to be. <laughs> who told her Bible even to the bathroom. You, you be who... <laughs> I don't know who you're going to be, but, but we are family for all of who we are. We are family. So let's pray for, for unity and fellowship to be genuine and authentic as we go into the rest of this year, that we will find ways, that we will find ways to love each other well, to preserve fellowship within our church family, because that's why we were created. We were not created to be in isolation. No. We were created for one another. So let's pray and begin to ask God, who is it that I need to reach out to this week that, I, that I've missed? Whom can I show the love of Christ to this week? For those who are on Facebook and over the phone and by Zoom, just begin to ask God, God, whom can I Show the love of Christ today or this week to you, that it might be evident that I love God. Father, thank you for loving us. And God, thank you that you tell us that you loved us first. Yeah. God, while we were stuck in our sins and stuck in our well, whatever we call it a life God you loved us God may love be evidence in our church family because we love one another God thank you for allowing me to see some of the comments God of people saying how much they love <laughs> all nations and they're saying our family God I'm encouraged that the love of God is evident here. God, may this 
love extend beyond all nations and begin to extend to those God who don't know you. And that when they look at all nations, they, they realize, man, there's some real love here. Not because people say, I love you, but because they've shown themselves to love. Thank you. So God, increase our capacity to love as we continue to lift our eyes to you. God, we give you honor and praise. God, for the person, God, who feels unloved and far away, God, would you, would you knock on their heart today and call them to you, save them so that, that they can be a part of this family? God, being a part of this family is not just a decision that we make, but we are born again into this family. God, would they experience your salvific power today that would redeem them to be a part of this family? God, reclaim that, that lost and drifting person. God, who, who said, hey, I'm part of God's family, but I'm, I'm a distant cousin. God, would you, would you bring them back to the fold? Would you, begin to, would you begin to convict their heart so they realize they have been a distant relative? But today they want to recommit themselves. God, would you meet them where they are? And God, for those who's outside the family of God, God, would you, would you get them connected to a local family so that they can experience the love of God firsthand? God, thank you. God, we thank you for reminding us that you love us and therefore we can love one another. Father, be glorified as your church is edified. God, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, just stay tuned for our announcements this morning. Amen. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you again for staying with us. Thank you for worshiping with us uh, this morning. I pray that 
uh, God has spoken to your heart and given you what you need. Uh, that is often my prayer. As I meet God, um, I, I want to meet God before I meet the people so that God will speak through me and I simply be a mouthpiece uh, of the Lord. And I pray that God, God's word will take root, that it will fall on good ground. That's my prayer, because as God's word fall, falls on good ground, it produces good fruit. And I'm going to see, I'm going to be looking to see if there's any good fruit among our church family. Amen. So, so we're praying if it's falling on good ground, that we're going to see good fruit. Amen. All right. Love you too. All right. So let's make it a reality. Uh, let me also, let me thank um, all of those who are um, joining us by phone or uh, by Facebook. Thank you so much for being a part of our services. Uh, we'll be getting in touch with you and commenting back uh, to some of the comments. Thank you for just really worshiping with us and, uh, and be, be in prayer that as we look ahead to the rest of this year, that we prayerfully consider how we uh, can regather in person uh, so that we can do so in a way that protects even the most vulnerable. So let's pray. Let's be in agreement on that. Can, can we do that? Can, can we begin to pray for that? That God will give us wisdom on how to come together again. All right. Well, guys, I love you. And the thing you can do about it. So I'm going to uh, ask our Zoom family, if you'll just hang in there, we're going to go into our breakout groups. And then for those who are on Facebook, we'll see you this Wednesday for Daddy Dar discussions and uh, our Bible study on Together Again as we continue to explore how do we do this thing together. If you notice my slide behind me, we are better together. We are. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. All right. God bless you.